Hello and welcome, friend. I'm so glad that you could join me today. Let's explore the 12 core virtues together in terms of what kind of activities we can do together to actually cultivate them. These are some of the things that we would do in our Discord server, uh, the Coffee House Academy, along with numerous other servers throughout uh, what is lovingly known as the intellectual dark web. Uh, different games and sharing activities that uh, were used to create authentic relating experiences. And I have put this presentation together to make sense of them in an archetypal way. This research is part of an ongoing world building project that I'm working on called Xandria, which is a community RPG that is utilizing fantasy environments to create a sense of space, even digitally, which might promote uh, good habits and social uh, togetherness and meaningful exchanges by virtue of the type of environment that they provide to the individual. Some of these community activities actually revolve around art appreciation, so I wanted to use that as the basis for this presentation today, and I went and collected various contemporary artists' work that I thought embodied the virtues that I was trying to convey, and there will be links to their work below, and I encourage you to go check them out if their uh, artwork is something that resonates with you. First up, as always, is Aries whose core virtue is courage. On these slides, I also wanted to include the phrase that accompanies the core virtue, as is shown on our Gift of Virtue Clarity deck, which is available on Kickstarter if you want to still get in on the pre-order. And so the phrase is, Fortune favors the bold. So how does an individual actually go about cultivating courage? We have lots of different parables about going on big adventures and overcoming fierce beasts and great obstacles and things like that, but from an everyday practical standpoint, there are other things that we can do to promote it in our everyday life. So just for reference, I've also included the missions here. I go into much greater detail about the relationship between them and the virtues in the extrinsic versus intrinsic video. So the first activity comes from a group that I haven't personally participated in, but I heard about and thought it was cool. Uh, as I understand it, it's a predominantly Facebook-based uh, community that is a support for the self-authoring suite by Jordan Peterson, and regardless of your feelings about him, I do highly recommend participating in that kind of intentional journaling, and having a support group around that to discuss uh, is a really difficult, but I, I think very worthwhile thing to do. It takes a lot of courage to speak so honestly about yourself and your process. So a lot of our campfire sessions uh, boiled down to topics of anger and grief management. I think there's something very important about uh, having a space to do that as a group and to receive consensus and validation from other people that they might be having similar feelings to you when it comes to anger in particular, um, and sitting with that and acknowledging it. Of course, there's a lot that the individual needs to then do to follow up and actually untangle that, but um, I think as a community that activity can be really healing. So drumming and rhythm activities in particular do not work very well uh, with Discord because of its noise-canceling capabilities. So. Uh, that's something that's still being explored, other apps or other audio input that would better facilitate that, but from the uh, numerous, numerous sessions that I've attended uh, of different communities in real life, uh, this is a very cathartic, very effective activity for uh, taking the pressure off of the individual to put on some kind of performance, you know, especially when you're harmonizing vocals, uh, even if they're just kind of noise, just kind of chaotic. It's such a great way to get out of your comfort zone and uh, get accustomed to being able to vocalize to a group and not be judged about it. Of course, this space being the camp, uh, any fitness activities or martial arts or 
choreography or flow or anything like that fits into this category. Uh, any of that participated in as a group is under this Aries archetype. So how do those type of activities actually help us cultivate courage? It's important to keep in mind that courage is not the absence of fear. It's even in the presence of fear, the ability to move past that and overcome the threat and not be paralyzed by the intimidation of the scale or the magnitude or the severity of the situation. So to build up that tolerance to adversity and be able to break down difficult situations into manageable pieces requires on a very primal level uh, physical fitness. You know, whatever that means to you and your personal goals. Uh, just whatever enables you to move fluidly and not be impeded by uh, as large a range of obstacles. Next up is Taurus, whose core virtue is generosity, which is the gift that keeps on giving. So the space for cultivating this is the hearth, and just as the kitchen is the heart of the home, there are various parts in a city or a town which are gathering places that we go to to share meals together. So activities that can be done to cultivate this energy is anything involving food, recipe testing or sharing, um, the entire platform of Pinterest or what it used to be kind of springs to mind for this type of uh, emphasis on crafts, applied art, do-it-yourself, uh, home improvement projects, uh, decoration and embellishment, and of course all different aspects of design. In our community we had a practice of show and tell where each week we'd gather to look at what each other were working on and appreciate it and give feedback and comment. Uh, you know, similar to an art critique you might do in school, but focusing very much on the uh, continued effort and the positivity of engaging the activity without so much of an emphasis on wanting the product to turn out a certain way. It's important to do art for its own sake and for therapeutic value, so sometimes participating in a group can be really great for overcoming any shyness or inhibition. Another way we would do this is just have a general show and tell activity and have people bring forth objects in their life that are significant to them and talk about the meaning and the history. And another part of this is tradition sharing, you know, talking about particularly holidays or special times and uh, things that were important in their family. And I find that using physical or visual reminders for this is really helpful for then taking that and engaging in some imaginative play to try to come up with new desired traditions for the, the community or for the individual moving forward in defining their own home and life. Another thing that we would do digitally during the time of lockdown uh, was to actually share meals together or come together for coffee or tea time. Uh, we also had this in a group I was a part of a long time ago that was the uh, tribute to the goddess Caffeina, which was our morning coffee intake ritual and discussion. So sharing meals together is really important for cultivating a sense of generosity in all other dimensions. Uh, we see that in the quote, uh, when you have more than you need, build a longer table, not a taller fence. And so that's very much the sentiment that is cultivated uh, when you willingly choose, especially on a regular interval, to come together and share meals. Next up is Gemini, whose core virtue is integrity. And the phrase is, bear witness to your own inclusion. And this space is one of the most active and developed in our particular community, and that is the library. Being in the air mode, library activities are particularly easy to host digitally because they're so compatible with that type of format. So at the birth of our community, and as it was growing, a lot of the emphasis would be on the role of librarian and doing 
organizational work of archiving, uh, wiki maintenance uh, of our own and the general Wikipedia, uh, making corrections and making sense of things. The coffee house in particular was a very project-oriented space and people of similar disciplines and interests would come together and assist each other with research. There's something very inspiring and motivating about going onto a campus and seeing things actively being worked on uh, and perhaps having a list of ongoing projects that you could choose to get involved with or clubs to join up. This was also a very playful space despite all the serious things going on. There were a lot of great creative writing projects, brain teasers, and language games. We had a lot of fun with language and came up with many of our own vernacular. So in envisioning the way that the space will continue to evolve and how this library will be different in the future from how the community has been structured in the past, uh, we would really like for the whole of the space to be more inclusive of different types of interests and for the library to be the hub that works to organize and integrate all of the other parts and to make it very easy to navigate. We used to refer to the coffee house as the portal to the other portals. So this is supposed to be a central hub where you can go and get directed to the other places where you might want to visit. So any type of sense-making activity facilitates integration. Anything that helps you to see and appreciate potentially disparate parts of yourself and come to know them as related and important. Of course, even working on this project and all the research that's gone into it and being able to present it to you now, uh, having another pair of eyes has been really invaluable for being able to step back and see the whole picture. And so special thanks to my partner Sapien, who has put so much into the server and into this particular project. Thank you. So next we have Cancer, the virtue of compassion, love thy neighbor as thyself. And I think very important to remember in that statement is first and foremost, love thyself. So not so ironically, the space that we do this in is the prototypical uh, self-care, uh, which is the bath. I'm going to be doing another video to follow up on this one, focusing more on historical examples of these spaces and take a more anthropological point of view. But baths were, in ancient times, more commonly a public affair. Of course, the infrastructure for plumbing is very extensive, very uh, difficult. So consolidating that and having it available in a central location made more sense than having it in every home. So in general, we achieve this energy cultivation through emotional vulnerability in the social sphere. And we do that through a number of different activities, my favorite of which was uh, super serious song sharing. And the basic premise was just that we could take any kind of song. It could be silly. It could be just a snapshot into a previous mode of being in life, or it could be, you know, one that is very personal and meaningful, or it could be even one that the uh, individual had personally composed. And one of the most entertaining aspects of this activity was also the accompanying music videos, which a lot of times, uh, you know, you might have heard the song but not seen it, and, you know, going to the way back and beholding some of those masterpieces was really a great community bonding activity. So in this family of activities is also just uh, partaking of shows and movies together and analyzing them and going over what their archetypical meanings might be and comparative religion and things like that. There was a group that was going through uh, Disney movies in particular and looking at their archetypes and that was really fun. So of course there's something of a hierarchy or a set of different thresholds of intimacy with these type of activities and engaging in the lower down more uh, general entry versions of this helps to build up the trust and closeness in the community to be able to modulate more serious uh, emotional 
moments or outbursts, you might say. Uh, it was a really great feeling uh, in previous communities to have a point in a conversation which was uncomfortable or escalating and have someone just be able to call time out and say more or less, you know, big feelings time and have anybody who was available for that uh, be present. And we had different formats for things like uh, dialogos or circling if it needed to be structured in some type of way. But there's something really cool and liberating about being to the point where people are receptive to handling that in real time. In particular, I think the work of Brene Brown is really poignant here in exploring uh, vulnerability and how empowering that can be in a group setting and being able to come forth and speak very candidly about your experience and be heard and held and received. So traditionally, of course, in the bathhouse, this would naturally happen because everybody was on equal footing with their vulnerability and being nude, but we can achieve that without all of that extra complication in the community just by being bare with our expression and feelings. Next up is Leo, whose virtue is loyalty. Fire is the test of gold, and adversity is the test of strong men. So the space for cultivating this energy is the Agora, also known as the Forum or the Marketplace. In the ancient times, this was the public square when people would gather, there would be stalls and merchants set up to exchange goods. And it was also a place where philosophers would gather and exchange ideas. So in the server, the main place where this exchange would happen was the casual channels. This would be the first place that people would end up who were new on the server. You know, they would come into the general chat and be introduced and a lot of the regulars would hang out there and sort of give them the rundown on the space and what we had on offer. So as the baths were the more intimate or personal side of the community emotional regulation, the Agora is the more public facing side. Uh, the server that I think best embodied this energy was that of Akira the Don, who throughout quarantine, uh, every single day, hosted uh, music streams, and people would sometimes hang out also in the Discord and chat to one another, or just type out and chat. And this type of vibe regulation general hangout, I think, really embodies that sense of community and loyalty and desire to come together with other people. This is also the space for announcements and for uh, planning and scheduling of community events and trying to ensure that everybody has their needs met and that things are not being scheduled over one another and any feedback from participants is usually taken in this space. So this energy is probably the one that I've explored the most in my own life uh, through my hosting adventures, uh, I used to put on theme events that were very vendor-centric and focused on helping getting small business owners to come out and show their wares and sell their goods. It seems to me the most controversial in this digital space because there's so much pushback against any kind of, you know, self-promotion or marketing, and it's such a contested territory, so it will be very interesting to explore in the future how to create an empowering and rich and vibrant space that doesn't feel over-advertised and oppressive. So many of our current social media outlets, such as Facebook, etc., which have taken over and dominated this archetype, it's going to be a real challenge to figure out what good can be done by social media and how we can use it to bring each other together rather than, you know, create this large negative force in our lives, which is very distracting and noisy, you know, as bazaars or marketplaces can tend to be when it's difficult to tune out the hawkers and criers and zero in on what's really important. Now we have Virgo, whose virtue is prudence. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. 
and the space for cultivating this virtue is in the garden. So each of these 12 spaces is actually part of six larger areas within this fantasy city that we are building. And I didn't want to get too far into it in this video to keep it nice and short and sweet. Uh, but along with the library, the garden is part of the academy complex. So you'll see a pattern emerging within those larger areas that some of the activities are pretty closely related. So on the garden side of things, we have uh, research being collated and actually put together into the presentations and exhibit design. Previously in the Academy, we would host all sorts of ongoing lecture series. We had many very talented individuals who would uh, give lectures on things like mathematics, on psychology, and eventually we developed a concept that we called Freeform Fridays, which was an attempt to encourage and empower people to uh, give their own presentation on anything. It was sort of a shorter format, you know, so there wasn't too much pressure to put together an hour-long presentation or something. Uh, and we would have several people go, so it kind of took the heat off the individual. And we would have a brief discussion about it after, but we found that offering that and having that be a consistent community event really helped people um, explore, you know, public speaking and presentations that several of them reported never having attempted before. And this is so important because we learn a lot by teaching. You retain so much more of it and it becomes crystallized when you have to try to explain the same thing to another person and make it relevant to them. So I think a large part of prudence and practicality is this type of implementation. And so activities include idea germination, experimentation, and constructive feedback. Just as we have critiques on the artistic side of things, we also need to offer up a safe space for people to bring forth ideas that are not all the way matured yet and get good feedback on more academic or research-based things. In the Awakening from the Meaning Crisis server, which follows the work of John Ravakey, of course, they have an ongoing Sangha practice and uh, we would regularly do uh, yoga as a group and I think it's valuable to do that if you don't have a live studio, even doing it following videos online. I think is helpful to, you know, just hold yourself accountable and keep active with your own practice. In exploring the garden space in the digital medium, we've been asking a lot of questions about how immersive we can make educational experiences, you know, as is the common practice in exhibit design for zoos, you know, the goal is to inspire and inform. So in researching campuses around the world, the blaring question has really been, why don't you have a zoo within a college? What could you do if space was not a limitation and you could simulate digitally an ideal learning environment? Next we have Libra, whose virtue is temperance. And the phrase is sober as a judge. So temperance might also be thought of as perspective. And the space which we explore that virtue is the basilica. And this was a particularly interesting archetype in architecture to explore because, of course, we have different buildings that are meant to impress, right? They can be kind of grandiose or imposing. And there's an interesting discussion around how much priority we've given these over uh, more human-oriented spaces and what the purpose might be of having such a uh, materially intensive construction. Civic spaces are where we usually host very structured activities. So for our community, this would be, we would have the regularly scheduled book clubs, uh, it could be paper study clubs, uh, basically things where people are coming together to pursue a common interest that is pre-established ahead of time and has a very regular meeting schedule. Because of the academic theme of the coffee house, we had a concept for the monthly theme activities, which would center around uh, a chosen literary theme, a popular book that would 
serve as the inspiration for numerous other community activities. For example, the first one we did had Alice in Wonderland as the theme, and so for our usual tea time meeting, everybody showed up with a fancy hat. It was very fun. So in cultivating temperance, why these kind of regular activities is helpful is because it helps to be able to modulate between turning the focus inward on yourself as an individual and giving up some of that uh, self-focus in order to be part of the larger group and being able to shift between those modes more fluidly is really helpful. I find that themes are really helpful for this because being able to enjoy a variety of things and kind of put yourself into uh, an external vibe or mode and role play a little bit helps to give more common ground for relating to other people. Also having a calendar that's kind of stacked with activities or has a lot of different choices for things that people could be interested in or participate in is really helpful as a community of course to ensure that everybody has a little something that they can take part in. Next is Scorpio with the virtue of purity. Shrouds have no pockets. For some reason this has been a really controversial virtue in conversation. I guess it has this automatic association with uh, sexual connotation for some reason. Uh, that's absolutely not what is intended by this. Purity is, you know, allowing to be something to be what it is for its own sake without need to compare it to another thing. So similar to what we just got done discussing with perspective, uh, purity has more to do with focus and the ability to isolate a thing in its own definition. And so the space where we explore this is the museum. As I mentioned, the very activity of art appreciation that we are currently engaged in with these slides is one of the main modes of this virtue. In order to make the most of the relatability of the water element itself and its natural propensity to connect the dots and bring things into relationship with one another, uh, you have to have a basis for comparison. And the best way to go about that is to really appreciate each thing uh, in itself before trying to compare. So in curating this collection and considering every single image and thinking about what the artist meant to convey and what message you might have to give to the viewer, uh, I was very much in the energy of purity. I think especially with art, our ability to do this is really being damaged by our constant you know, scrolling feeds that just kind of throw everything together. There's no kind of pattern or curation. So it's very easy to overlook things that might actually be quite outstanding or meaningful because it's all kind of carelessly thrown together. When you go to a museum and you see every piece carefully curated and put in relation to each other, uh, especially things like sculpture when they're isolated on their own pedestals and kind of set apart and allowed to be their own thing, so you can take in and appreciate every single piece, creates a more valuable total experience than uh, most of the art activity that we're subjected to on a regular basis, which is just, you know, the scrolling. I think it's important both for the curator and for the viewer. I think it's good to put ourselves in the position of curator from time to time and share things that we relate to with other people. One way that we really cultivated this was through our poetry club. A lot of people found a lot of bravery in that time who hadn't really had the courage to come forward with their personal work before. And our format was very open. People were welcome to share things either that they'd written or just a poetry piece written by someone else that they liked. And the mix of all of that was really great. And we found that the vibe tended to kind of regulate itself as we were doing this because each participant, uh, even though we were kind of queuing up in a line to plan ahead, uh, there tended to be this desire to create a cohesion or a collection within just the people who were present there. And each reader would seem to 
try to create something that would follow appropriately after the previous. We would also do different gratitude exercises, one of which would be putting someone on the spot or, you know, kind of picking one person from the group and going around the circle and everyone saying something that they appreciated about them. And that type of isolation, I think, cultivates purity and ability to see things just as they are. And that helps also to cultivate our sense of reality and presence in the moment. Sagittarius has the virtue of discipline. Practice is the best of all instructors. Uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is about a sculpture class where half of the class was asked to create a single perfect piece of pottery to be presented for their final grade. And then the other half uh, was simply asked to make as much as they could and would be graded by overall weight. So ironically, it was the quantity students that ended up prevailing also on quality because they were putting the repetitions in and improving kind of despite the premise. And the ones who had been tasked with creating perfection got really caught up and tripped over uh, the standard rather than putting the work into simply being good at the craft. And the space we cultivate this is in the stadium. That's part of the gymnasium complex along with the camp that we talked about in Aries. So I referred to the circling activities and dialogos a little bit earlier. That also falls into this category of uh, regular practice and authentic relating. And in general, team building activities also end up here, which a lot of our gaming and playfulness constituted. And of course, Discord got its start and is predominantly known for being a voice chat mediator for video games. Uh, so in pursuing these other uses for it, you know, such as dark web community activities, uh, at first we really tried to break away from that stereotype and differentiate. Uh, but we found that there were quite a few types of games that actually did really facilitate our interpersonal relationships. In particular, any type of sandbox activities or games which allowed us to build things together as a team uh, really helped with our later exchanges where we had to work together. And so in exploring this RPG that we're building, the city of Xandria, the stadium and the spirit of playfulness itself is really important for the type of experience that we're trying to create. So one of the things that really differentiates the activities of the camp from the stadium, and also one of the concepts that I've been really fixated on in developing this game, is the continuous actions of the camp versus the instance-based actions of the stadium, right? When you go to view a sport at the Olympics, you're seeing a snapshot of their total practice. You're only seeing a very short demonstration of something that they have done thousands and thousands of times. So we want to create something interactive in very small amounts, you know, breaking down a large problem into very manageable pieces through micro actions that will accumulate and create more value in the total game experience. And on to Capricorn with the virtue of fortitude. Do not fall before you are pushed. The place where we cultivate this is in the studio. And the studio and the hearth are part of the same complex, so there is some overlap of the activities. We talked about the show and tell and sharing and creative activities over in the hearth, but the distinction is that in the studio is mostly where the production takes place and the work time itself. The main way we would cultivate this was through hosting open studio and having everyone come together in a creative accountability type setting where we would all be working on our respective projects, uh, just kind of in one server muted to create a sense of shared workspace. And I found this to be very effective. It was nice as I work from home myself uh, to have a pretend office environment where other people were going about their business. As this is my area, my personal ambition for seeing this building evolve uh, is to put more of a focus on the architectural 
and engineering disciplines and do more contemporary design solution case studies, look at people who are working on projects and go through those as a group. I think it's really important to take a look at the workflow and the process of other people who are doing similar things to try to see areas that they've already innovated or improved on. This is different than the individual focus of the hearth, looking at personal work and personal projects and uh, spending time appreciating what the individual is doing. This is more a macro look at how to improve the process of work itself. And this is helpful to cultivate fortitude because I think there's a lot of pressure as a creative to go your own way or go it alone or come up with all of the answers and it's easy to lose sight of how many other people are you know struggling in maybe a similar way and to take some support from that and on to Aquarius with the virtue of adaptation a change is as good as a rest and this quote really spoke to me thinking about you know boredom and how Part of that is our body trying to indicate to us that there might be alternatives that we're not pursuing and, you know, our imagination is trying to pressure us into being more curious and explorative. And the space where we explore that imaginative quality is in the theater through caricature or improv or role play. I want to inject one revelation that I've had recently just because I thought it was so clever. Uh, and that was that the difference between something like an MMORPG and a LARP is that in a LARP, all of the NPCs are human. And that's actually kind of a profound thought. And, you know, part of what makes a tabletop pen and paper RPG like Dungeons and Dragons uh, so much more immersive and interactive is that you have a human DM who is having to think on the fly and change up the scenario based on what is presently happening. So in a good conversation, that's naturally happening. But in a fairly well-balanced conversation, of course, every participant is a player. So it's been very interesting to try to visualize what a game might be like where you have a different role, something more like a non-scripted character which I used to play in a LARP and I enjoyed very thoroughly because it gave the freedom to be something more than, you know, an NPC uh, cannon fodder to just be killed, uh, but had a lot more exposition and structure than having to perform as a player all of the time. One of the easy ways that we can achieve this in a digital format is through a choose your own adventure, which has already been somewhat curated and we're seeing advances all the time in uh, AI participation in this and procedural generation. And it's important to keep in mind always that the objective of participating in these kind of games is to enhance our adaptability and to see how we might behave and anticipate uh, be able to think on the fly through playing through role play scenarios and testing our own limits. And finally, we have Pisces with the virtue of vigilance. Who watches the watchers? So vigilance is a very different energy than that of focus. It entails something more like a distributed attention or peripheral attention, which is on the lookout for anything outstanding or, you know, motion in the periphery. Noticing patterns or noticing something out of place is very important for social cohesion, just as compassion and emotional regulation is. And so the place that we cultivate vigilance is the temple, which is part of the Hygieia complex along with the baths. As I mentioned earlier, this is where we hold the meditation sangha, as well as various other therapeutic practices, such as breathing exercises, relevance realization, and anything that cultivates inspiration or explores spirituality. 
Now, this temple isn't meant to be specific to any particular denomination or religion. This is meant to be a place for comparative religious studies and for pursuit of a better understanding of all the traditions of this world. In cultivating vigilance, it's important to have a place that is free and safe to talk about those type of things, even though, of course, in common practice, this is a very taboo and frowned upon subject to even touch on. I think it's very important to us as human beings to talk about these things and discouragement or limitation from doing so uh, doesn't really make us more resilient as a whole. So very closely related, of course, to the academy complex and to lifelong learning uh, in totality, uh, the more that you understand and know about the world, the broader your perception and noticing of things that either form patterns or stand out will be. Thank you for coming along with me on this journey through the conceptual phase of Sandria. You are welcome to check out the new overhauled website, which I'm continuing to work on and offer more interactive components to, uh, to check out more about this project. Thank you.